ready to rock and roll if you are. Okay, and I'm calling in on my other phone just uh, real quickly. Uh, this one's working okay. This, is, this one's working okay. I'll just go forward. Um, yeah, I'm getting a lot of crackling still here too, Earl. Um, all right, let me go ahead and get it kicked off then, and we'll go from there. Uh, as, <laughs> as is often the challenge, sometimes technology doesn't always work well correctly as it's supposed to, so we had a, a, I appreciate the uh, little bit of patience and grace from everybody. Um, Earl McLean, one of our lead coaches here, is, is uh, you know one of my good friends and, and has been a, a strong part of helping us grow this program and build this series for you guys. So I definitely wanted him to, to, to be where he can share insight throughout the program. But I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off at this point. And so I wanted to welcome everybody, first of all, to the second in our series, the Maximum Performance Webinar Series. And as I alluded to a few minutes ago, our goal and design here is to create a solid program that you guys can become a, a regular participant with. The idea is to keep fresh topics of what you guys need. Uh, information, advice, guidance, and support from our direct coaching experience one-on-one -on -one with clients to bring to you guys the information that is going to help you grow your business and navigate the challenges that you're facing in the current market environment. So today's program is really focused on this concept of is good the enemy of great? And, and some of this is, is, you know, alludes back to the themes of the book by Jim Collins that was published uh, about five, eight years ago. Uh, about eight years ago called Good to Great, uh, which was an extensive research project conducted by Jim Collins, who's a uh, business professor at the University of Colorado, Boulder. And uh, anyway, but some of the ideas that we're talking about in today's program are specifically the challenges and obstacles that we face when it comes to being reactive versus proactive. Um, and, and how easily it is to fall out of the driver's seat in our day-to-day -day business and then what happens as a result of that. Um, so, you know, the first thing to really consider as we're getting started here, and, and Earl, you know, feel free to jump back in here and let me know when you've been able to sign back on. But some of the okay. key concepts that we think about is, is, you know, how crazy does life get and how easy is it to all of a sudden find ourselves completely overwhelmed, overworked, and overloaded. So, if, you know, if you're beginning to feel like you're behind, if you're beginning to feel like you can't keep up, like uh, everybody else is driving your day, there's a high probability that you've fallen into a mode we call hyperreactivity, and and it, it it is exactly like it sounds. You've you've so you've gotten so far beyond being in charge of what you do and being proactive in how you run your day, everybody else around you is controlling how you spend the hours that you have. And at the end of the day, we all have a fixed number of hours. You know, we all have a limit to our capacity, our energy level, and the other commitments we have outside of our daily work. So, you know, for some people that you have a good productive 10 hours a day, other people have a good productive 8 hours a day, other people have a good productive 15 or 18 hours a day. So whatever your limit is, whatever your capacity threshold is, there's really only one of two ways that you operate your day. Either you're driving how you spend those hours or somebody else is. So the question becomes, are you in the driver's seat or is somebody else? And what happens as a result? Well, I mean, think about just, uh, you know, for a, a perfect analogy, let's just think about a simple and easy concept. Let's imagine... Uh, that, you know, in our business, we do have some analytical stuff that we have to do that requires a, a, a relatively deep level of concentration, right? I mean, for example, let's say we're doing a pre-qualification review for a new potential loan customer. And, and let's say we're doing a, a review of their credit report. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty thick credit report. The guy's, you know, got quite a bit of credit experience. We're about halfway through the review of that credit report. Let's say we're 10 to 15 minutes deep in the report but we're still trying to understand where the duplicates are. We're still trying to analyze which debts should or shouldn't be counted in ratios. We're still trying to assess from a general quality of credit, is this borrower going to qualify or not? But we haven't finished the review, and all of a sudden our phone rings. We look at the caller ID, and it's a phone number we don't recognize that's local. So our assumption, right, immediately is that it's a new potential lead, right? So we don't want to miss that call, so we take that call. It turns out, in fact, to be a new lead, but what just happened to the 15 to 20 minutes we spent reviewing the credit report that didn't finish? 
It's pretty much gone, right? The practical reality of, of the reactivity of letting that phone call take us off the task we were in the middle of means we just basically obliterated 15 minutes worth of activity. And the mind shift that had to take place, the physiological changes that had to take in our brain to shift gears from the analytical logic and, and analysis functions to the creative, communicative, rapport building functions, how long does it take us to get back into analytical mode? See, it's that, I mean, that's just one simple example of how interruptions, distractions, and overload will absolutely destroy our efficiency. And this is, of course, you've all heard the cliche of Einstein's definition of insanity, right? doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? Now, the challenge with cliches is we can't afford to ignore cliches because at the end of the day, would it have ever been repeated enough times to be ignored if it weren't fundamentally true? So think about that statement or quote one more time in light of the fact that it is one of those cliches or one of those statements that would never have been repeated enough that we ignore it and think or dismiss it because we think it's cliche if it weren't fundamentally true. So the first thing that we've got to do when it comes to battling hyper-reactivity is we've got to recognize the insanity of it all. The second thing we have to do is what is, what is Einstein really teaching us to do here? I mean, if you were to sum it up in one word, what would be the one word? Essentially, it's change, right? But where does change take place first? What we're really talking about when it comes to battling hyperreactivity and the loss of efficiency and all the distractions, what we're really talking about is behavior change. Okay? And it starts with, our human physiology, it starts with how we think about what we do, what our function and role is, and all those other elements. At the end of the day, every decision we make physically alters our brains. The neural pathways that are created become much like, um, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we had an English setter, his name was Max, and, and Max would tread the same path back and forth across our backyard multiple hundred times a day because his, 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 you know, his kennel and his doghouse was in the far back left corner of our backyard and his food and water bowl uh, was on the deck in the front right corner of the backyard. And Max would tread that path so many times a day that by the, you know, within six months to a year of getting the dog, um, that thing was like concrete, right? No grass would grow there. That's how entrenched that pattern was. And so what we have to think about is, is based on the thoughts and habits we create, the more that that thought recurs, the more entrenched that pattern of behavior becomes. So some of what we're going to challenge you to think about doing today may not exactly be easy. In fact, it may be downright hard because what you're talking about is shifting well-ingrained behavior patterns. So our goal is to give you the tools and resources to help you do that, to create that transformational shift in how you operate on a daily basis. And the first major shift that you've got to make is who's running your day. You know, in the Lone Toolbox, um, which is, you know, some of you know that, that uh, our coaching program was originally developed and sponsored and funded by the Lone Toolbox organization, um, and we now enjoy a very good relationship, although we no longer are owned by uh, Morgan Success Force, we do have a very strong affiliate relationship and partnership with the Mortgage Success Source family of companies. Well, one of their lead um, speakers or gurus over the years has, has been a gentleman by the name of David Allen. Uh, hopefully you guys have heard of him. One of his, his foundational works was a book called Getting Things Done. And he kind of broke the mold on the classic model of time management. One of the things he challenged us to realize is that reactivity is the number one killer of productivity. So the first major behavioral shift 
that you've got to challenge yourself to make, and you need to start building a new pattern of thinking and behavior is this whole idea of are you in your driver's seat of your day or is everybody else around you? Okay? So think back to that, that uh, credit report analogy. Okay? So one of the things that we're going to work on is we're going to work on some specific techniques that are going to help you get in the driver's seat. One of them is a strategy we call a personal billboard. Okay? Imagine if instead of just reacting to that phone call when it rang, you had a split-second reminder that challenged you to think before you reacted. What if you had a little strip of paper or a post-it note taped to your phone that said, what will this call cost me? So in that split-second decision between do I hit the answer button or not, you would think about, geez, I really ought to finish this credit report or I'm going to lose 15 minutes worth of work here. So you let that call go to voicemail, you finish the work you're in five to ten minutes later, and then you pick up that voicemail message and respond to that next concern. Now, practical reality is, how many customers out of 10 would you lose? How many customers out of 100 would you lose by making them wait 15 minutes for a return phone call? Would you all agree that pretty much you know, less than 5 out of 100? And by the way, what does that tell you about the 5 that you would potentially lose because you didn't answer the call immediately? If they're that impatient and that disrespectful of your time that they won't wait 15 minutes for a return call, doesn't that kind of indicate that they're the kind of person that's going to be a major headache to work with anyway and an extremely high-maintenance client? How many more man hours will you typically spend on that kind of a jerk customer as opposed to going out and getting two or three more that are easy, courteous, and respectful to work with? So that's the first key strategy here is to look at a personal billboard, creating some barriers to who controls your day and get you in the driver's seat of your day again. Okay? There's another analogy that comes into play, um, and there's a, a former client who kind of coined this phrase, but the other question here is to think about, do you want to be always available or worth waiting for? I want to let that question sink in for just a second. And I want to articulate that point. Are you, is it better to be always available or worth waiting for? Now, the gentleman who introduced Earl and I uh, was a gentleman by the name of Rene Rodriguez. Rene Rodriguez was introduced to me by a former client of ours by the name of Eric Mitchell. Eric Mitchell was the gentleman who coined that phrase, worth waiting for. Now, there's a number of different analogies that you can come into play with that, but think about just in general sense of life, even, even not in your mortgage business or your professional advisory services that you provide or what you do for customers. I mean, let's talk about hairdressers for an example, uh, you know, or hairstylists or whatever the politically correct term is for just a second. Do you want your hair cut by the person who's sitting around waiting, twiddling their thumbs? Or do you want your hair cut by the person who has a waiting list that you have to book an appointment with a couple of days down the road. Who do you respect more? Who do you trust more? I mean, I know that's a really obscure analogy, but think about it. Uh, another example, uh, let's talk about attorneys for just a second. Who do you trust more? The attorney that you have to pay him a $3,000 retainer before you can even get an appointment with him or the guy who's trolling the uh, emergency room looking for cases, chasing ambulances. You know, both are fully licensed attorneys, but who do you think is going to do a better job of representing you in, for example, a, uh, a, a, a business separation lawsuit or a, a personal injury claim or qualifying you for disability if you apply for disability? Who would you trust more? So. I'm not saying you're, you know, that you guys are all attorneys and that kind of thing, but it's just that concept to think about. 
is it better to be always available or worth waiting for? Would you all pretty much agree that you're going to be more efficient, more productive, and have a better level of credibility and rapport with your customers if you're worth waiting for? And the few customers you might lose because you're not immediately available, are they really worth your time anyway? Okay, so the second key concept we talk about is stress management. One of David Allen's foundational concepts is talking about the stress and what happens to our inefficiency. You'll also find a lot of parallels between today's program and what we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks when it comes to attitude management and mindsets of success, which I believe is, Earl, if you can look up the date on that one for me, I think that's the uh, uh, November 3rd webinar. Oh, I take that back. That'll be the November 20th webinar is we'll be talking about mindsets of success. But one of the things that David Allen talks about is that the number one reason that we have stress and that we start to begin to feel deflated or, or inefficient or lose productivity is because of this issue stress. And the, the number one cause of stress is because of agreements we don't keep with ourselves. We, we, set, the, we set unrealistic expectations. We have too much on our plate, we promise ourselves too much, and we expect too much. Because those of you that are most successful in the industry or have the highest probability of being uh, overachievers, and as a result, the, the, your greatest strength can often become your greatest weakness, which means if you put a task list, if you don't think through how much time it's going to take to complete the tasks that you've decided you want to complete today, what happens to your efficiency? If you're focused, let's say you start the day with 10 things you want to get done, but really with what you've already committed to and what's already locked into your calendar, you really only had the practical bandwidth to get three of the 10 things done. How do you feel? Disconnected, deflated, inefficient. Is that good for productivity or bad? What if you started the day with the two to three things that were realistic that you could fit into the day and you got them done by 2.30 in the afternoon and you still had a couple of hours worth of time left. How much energy and excitement would you have to maybe getting a fourth item done? How much more effective would you be at the other things that you're going to do the rest of that day? Because you could celebrate the fact that you've accomplished three things instead of being upset about the seven things that you didn't get done that were unrealistic to begin with. So what we're really talking about is a simple concept called activity management. And I mentioned earlier that, that you know, at the end of the day, we all have a fixed number of hours each day. So we really can't manage time, right? We can't add or delete hours from the clock. What we can do is the manage the choices we make with how to use those hours. The other thing you have to begin to realize about the human mind is that we don't think in priority order. Not all actions are created equal, but in our brain they take up the same amount of space. It's just like if you, if, if you, you know, when you start opening, you know, if you've ever gone couple of days without shutting your computer down. And, and every once in a while I do this occasionally is, is I, I, you know, I'll get five or six or seven or eight different Word documents open for different projects. I'll have a couple of spreadsheets open. I'll, uh, you know, I'll be logged into my Encompass and I'll have um, a loan I'm working on and, and then I'll go to open a, a, you know, a Google, a web browser for a Google search to find some information I need for a presentation I'm working on. And all of a sudden my computer locks up on me because I've stretched it to its absolute limit capacity-wise. Well, our brains are pretty much the same way. We all have a limited amount of mental bandwidth. For some, it's better than others, but at the end of the day, you run out of RAM. And the closer you get to that limit, the less efficient you become. So that's where we start to begin to get into some of the tactical elements of staying on focus and being clear and being disciplined about our thought. So our first behavior change was control your time. You be in the driver's seat of what you spend each hour of the day doing, and the personal billboards help you with that. The second behavior shift that we're going to make is 
how do we create priority of focus? Now, this doesn't apply to the personal value element, personal commitments. This is just an economics of time spent analogy for the typical loan officer 9 to 5 Monday through Friday or 9 to 6 or 7 to 7 <laughs> depending on your schedule and, and all of you may have different limits or parameters for that. This is just purely the economics of what we do for a living. As originators, here's what it looks like though. Think about it from this perspective. Okay, so let's say we want to go out and build a referral partnership. We expect that partnership to be worth approximately six deals a year. Let's say gross revenue to our company on average is $4,000 per deal. Are those numbers that you can all generally agree with across a pretty wide range of markets. Yours might be a little bit less or a little bit more, so your numbers might be a little bit off. But in general, if we develop one strong committed re realtor partnership, and that realtor is worth six deals a year, closed loans, that's about 24000 in revenue to the company, right? Now, on average, over an eight to 10 week period, if I meet with that agent, I take them to lunch several times, um, we talk about strategies of how to help them grow their business and how I can be a better asset to them than who they're currently working with. Would you all generally agree it's going to average out to 10 to 15 man hours of work over an eight week period? At the end of you know taking them to lunch four or five times, meeting with them uh, you know for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, five or six times over the course of eight weeks, they're either going to be in or out pretty much, right? So at the end of the day, 10 hours worth of work to generate six deals a year that are worth 4,000 per deal equals about 24,000 in revenue per year divided by the 10 hours we spent to build that partnership, our hourly value is $2,400 an hour. Okay. Now, the second major function we spend our time doing as originators is originating. You know, by the way, the way that we define this in our business development model, the pyramid of a complete loan officer, partner building falls under the marketing, which is lead generation. Loan origination falls under the sales. The separation between marketing and sales is marketing is about lead generation. Sales is about lead conversion or capture. Okay, so all in, how many man hours does it normally take to get a loan done from first phone call to where we have a live deal in the system? And when I say live deal, I mean we're talking a fully ratified contract purchase or a refinance that the borrower has fully committed to moving forward with and we have a check for the appraisal. Would you all agree that, you know, I mean, some, some are harder than others. Some require more questions to be answered. Others are a lot easier, and it's a, it, you know, it's kind of a layup deal. But at the end of the day, it averages out to probably about 10 man hours worth of work from first contact to, you know, to live deal. Would you all agree with that number, plus or minus? So if that deal is worth approximately 4000 in gross revenue to the company, at 10 hours of activity, that's $400 per hour activity. Now, here's the scary part about that. Every hour you spend capturing deals versus going out and bringing in more deals potentially costs the company $2,000 every single hour. Now, the next layer down is loan origination or loan processing activity. Now this is where the, the analogy may be a little bit harder to work on because processing from live contract all the way to closing can vary widely depending on the difficulty of the loan, the structure, the environment you're in, and what you even define as processing. Um, but it's basically what has to be done, all the administrative stuff. So even if you could get it done in 10 hours, which I'm beginning to doubt that's even possible in today's environment, but let's say we could get it done. Okay, so even if, even if I just, let's double this. Okay, let's say it's 20 man hours from start to finish to get a loan done. And let's say that the processing part of the revenue, uh, we charge a $400 processing fee or we absorb $400 that stays at the top of the house to cover the processing overhead for that loan. So at $400, uh, you know, 
times 10 hours, you were talking $40 an hour. If you doubled the amount of time to 20 hours, we're talking $20 an hour. Essentially, it comes down to what could you hire somebody for in your market? A well-qualified, experienced processor, what are they going to make? What is it going to cost you to hire that person in your market? That's the hourly value of that position. If you wanted to go back to sort of how we do appraisals, what somebody will and won't uh, pay for it kind of thing. But do you guys see how this begins to sort out? Our highest and best use as originators is to do what we're hired to do, which is make it rain, bring business in the door, market. Our second highest and best use is the conversion and capture function. Our third highest best use is what it takes to get a deal done from start to finish. Now, to the extent that we can peel these lower payoff activities away, that frees us up to spend a greater percentage of our time on the highest payoff activities. So as you begin to evaluate what you should spend your time doing and how you should organize the choices of how you spend each hour of each day, does this equation come to mind? Do these figures and values pop into your head? If not, what do we need to do to try and create that for yourself? Well, one of the tactical strategies we can use is what we call a time tracker exercise. Now, for anybody who's enrolled in our coaching program, our one-on-one -on -one clients, or even our group coaching program members, you'll have access to a web-based version of this system, which is called Time Tracker. Basically, this, the exercise is very simple. And by the way, we're going to give you a spreadsheet uh, at the end of today's webinar that will help you do this. Um, actually, the email that will automatically go out to all the registered attendees for the program um, later this afternoon you'll have a copy of the spreadsheet attached with some instructions on how to use it. But basically, the time tracker study is very, very simple in its design. Every 15 minutes throughout the day, you write down what you just spent the last 15 minutes doing. It's an information gathering function. You know, there's, there's a side benefit to it, which is that you typically will be more efficient and more productive and more proactive just by the simple fact that you're tracking your activity, that it's your, your, especially if you're reporting it to somebody else, you know, whether it's a colleague that you ask to be your account, accountability partner, or whether it's a manager or your coach, if that level of oversight and outside perspective advisory type position exists, if you have that mentor in place, the fact that you know you're being tracked will increase your performance. It's the simple law we call the Hawthorne effect. It means what gets measured gets done. If you know your time is being tracked, your time is going to be used more efficiently by default. Okay, uh, Just a functional psychological trick that we can use to create higher level of performance in a shorter period of time. But beyond that, it's also the data mining that you need to do. It's the investigative work to assess where are you on track and where are you off track. If you log your time every 15 minutes and you find yourself, um, which by the way, there's two tricks to this. If you find yourself doing, you know, doing multiple functions that spread across, there's really four primary roles in our business, right? Marketing, selling, sip chasing, or processing. I'll, I'll show you a slide in a little bit that will remind you of that. But if you find yourself spread across more than two areas in a 15-minute period of time, that's a pretty good indication that you're functioning under a reactive use of time versus a proactive use of time. Secondly, is it will begin to help you identify. This becomes the raw material you need to, after a two to three day review of what you've just spent the last three days doing, you'll be able to summarize how much time you spent on high payoff activities, the marketing functions, how much time you spent on mid-level payoff activities, the sales functions, and how much time you spent on the low payoff activities, the production or processing work. As a result, you then have some raw data to work with to determine what are you spending your time doing and what needs to be delegated or eliminated from what you do on a daily basis. Now, the second key function, there's a tip that I'm going to slip in here really quickly. I'm not going to go too deep into it because one of the tools we're going to provide you will give you a lot of feedback and background. It's called batching. Batching is where you basically chunk 
Uh, chunking is another term we often refer to it as, but it's basically where you group like activities together. You know, you know on any given week you're going to have two to three new pre-approval reviews that you're going to have to do. You know in any given week you're going to have a series of phone calls you're going to have to make to referral partners to update them on what's going on with the loans in process. You know you're going to have, you know, there's some key functions that are just more or less repetitive. So let's, let's just take those two first examples I just gave you. You know, the, the pre-qualification review and analytics and the customer service communication and rapport building phone calls, building relationships and managing transactions. Okay. Require two very different parts of the brain to be functional and active. Require very different mindset and methodology. In fact, this is a physiological effect because blood flow has to shift from the logic and analytical centers of the brain to the communicative and rapport building sales side of the brain. Okay. Batching allows you to be more efficient and more focused because you're doing more of the same type of activity that requires the same level of concentration. So instead of trying to spread you know, your, your pre-qualification reviews out across multiple phone calls to real estate agents, group your pre-quals together. At least finish one full pre-qual review before you return a phone call from an agent. And if, if you can, do all three of them. You know, how long does it really take you to do it? If you do it right and you're efficient and you know what you're doing, you know, worst case, even on a complicated deal, what, 30, 45 minutes maybe? So if you've got two or three pre-referral reviews to do, if you built in two 90-minute to two-hour time slots a week where you work on pre-approval reviews and you do those two or three reviews during that 90-minute segment of time, it's done, it's out of the way, and then you can shift back to your creative report building mind faster. Okay. Now the batching activity, I'll, uh, there's some, some, some of the tips and follow-up materials that we're going to provide to you will include it. But a lot of it comes back to this one key concept, this hourly rate of value or hourly rate of pay. How much time did you spend? And this is kind of the review of that time tracker study. Okay. Time tracker study, you, you summarize for three days what you just spent you know, the last three days doing. You break it up into how much time did you spend marketing, how much time did you spend selling, how much time did you spend doing what I call, what, well, hopefully you guys aren't lost, but when I say stiff chasing, yes, Mr. Customer, if you don't get me that W-2 that I've asked for six times, you will not close on time. I need it by the end of the day. Please get it to me. That's what I mean by stiff chasing. You guys have all been there, right? Okay, processing, um, and, and you know, a lot of people lump these two together under the title of processing. Um, I also often refer to the stip chasing as customer service functions. You know, it's the communication and influence functions. That there is some selling involved, but really it's more for the customer's benefit. Processing, I refer to really as more of what most companies, particularly the larger mortgage banking organizations, refer to as processing, which is as the process of getting that file navigated through underwriting, getting it packaged properly, getting it submitted, getting the underwriting conditions gathered and, and packaged properly for conditions review and clearing and all of the other functions it takes to get that loan approved and closed on the back end. Because often the stip chasing stuff is what gets handed back to the loan officer at the front lines. Now, on that time tracker study, first thing to ask yourself is what, where do you use your time group? How much time over three days did you spend marketing, selling, stip chasing, or processing? The second most important question is what should you delegate, defer, or delete? I like the chat comment. Thanks, Walt. Yeah, I think we'd all pretty much agree that we want to get rid of stip chasing as fast as possible. That's one of the clearest easiest ways to increase your productivity and profitability as quick as possible. Now, the politics of navigating that within your organization change from situation to situation, but it is something you want to start working on as quickly as possible. Um, we'll talk about some of that kind of stuff in a future session. All right, so a couple of key things that we want to share. After you've done all that, the last tip or the last behavior shift I want you to make is 
what do you do as you're beginning to implement some of these ha habits and it starts to break down and, and, and you start to feel like you're getting off task again? And what are some things that you can do proactively that limit the probability of some of that happening? Well, there's a couple of key functions to work on. One is doing what we call crash course time management using a mind map. Now, you know, I'm an advocate of using the David Allen getting things done system. All of our coaches use that system as a functional way that we manage our day and we have the Outlook add-in that we use. But if you've not gone to that level of experience, you can still do a lot of the same functions with really more of a crash course shoot from the hip approach. And one of the tools we use is what we call a mind map. It's basically a brainstorming technique, which is everything that needs to be done, you just start flowing ideas onto the page. You just dump them down. And they're going to come out in random. But as you jot those notes down, consider whether it's at the project or the action level. So this is a mind map I recently did, just as an example. In the course of about 15 minutes of thinking, just brainstorming, this was all the stuff that was on my mind. When I was beginning to get to that shutdown level, when I was beginning to feel like I was completely overwhelmed in complete task saturation mode, this was one of the best defenses you have. Get it off your mind. But get it out of your mind into something that at least gives you some visual reference that you can prioritize. Because what will happen is as you dump out all these random thoughts or ideas, you may think of, for example, the first one, draft important questions for intake call list under team training. And the very next thing you think of is, I need to confirm my hotel reservations for that Vegas conference. Because our brain doesn't think in priority or linear order. Our brain thinks in random. But once you've got it out on the page, it's very quickly and very easily able to assess, okay, what are my highest priority activities? Well, one of them is coach marketing. Okay, I need to make sure those leads from 10 7 webinar are being followed up appropriately. What do I need to do uh, with referral partner development? I need to schedule the next session with Jared and Emily. Jared and Emily being potential referral partners that I'm working to develop a stronger relationship with. Those are two really high payoff activities. Those are my next most priority, and that's all I care about right now. I'm going to get that done. Then when I'm done with that action item, I'm going to cross that off the list and come back and look for what's my next highest payoff activity. So there's a key question that comes in here behaviorally, which is what's the next most valuable thing I can be doing? And as David Allen says, sometimes it's time to water the flowers. Sometimes the next most valuable thing I can do is close my computer and head home and spend some time with my kids because I'm fried. We reach that point where we need that recoup, that rejuvenation. We've pushed as hard as we can for as long as we can. It's time to check out for a few minutes and give ourselves some regroup time. Okay, so a second key behavior and strategy we can implement that will help with this is what we call a daily briefing and debriefing. Now, the instructions are pretty self-explanatory, and I'm going to give you a tool that will do this. This is what we call the daily briefing worksheet. It walks you through step-by-step -step how, to, how to start your day with a 10 to 15-minute briefing session and end your day with a 10 to 15 minute debriefing session, which is going to accomplish a number of key functions. And that's what I want to spend my time walking you through. Is this something you would use daily indefinitely you know, for the rest of your life? No. But it is something that you can use that will help set you on the right path and help you develop habits of starting and ending your day being proactive versus reactive. And this process, will, this worksheet will walk you through how to do it eventually it will become habit and you won't need to use this worksheet anymore. Okay? But the first step is the daily briefing. What's the most important goal right now? This week, what is my highest and most important goal that I'm working on? Okay? Second question is, what steps, if I completed them today, would give me significant progress towards those goals? And notice there's only four boxes. With everything else that's on our plate and everything else that we have to do that we've already committed to and promised to, how much bandwidth do you really have on any given day? And again, it it's kind of comes back to that concept of if I do two things and get them done by 1030, then I'm feeling really good about my day, and I can maybe crank out two or three more. But if I start my day with six things on my list and I only got five done, how do I feel? 
See, it really comes back to that progress focus. And that progress focus is, is be careful that we're not chasing the horizon which moves indefinitely forward. So if we focus on our progress that we're making today versus yesterday, this week versus last week, this month versus last month, we're going to be energized and encouraged and we'll have a much better attitude and much better ability to be productive and proactive versus if we're focused on the distance to the goal and then we're beating ourselves up about it. So that's where the second piece of this daily debriefing comes in. Not only are we doing a true assessment of where our, our results are, but we're also doing that attitude check of what progress did we make today? What went well? What do we want to make sure gets repeated in future days activity? The second question is where can I improve? What were my opportunities for growth from today? What can I learn from the things that didn't go quite the way I wanted them to today? And then what do I need to change moving forward? What's the next necessary action or what change needs to be made? Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and shift and let's, let's take some live questions. Um, well, if you would help me kind of moderate this. If you, uh, but you guys should all be seeing the chat screen. should be popping open for you. And if you guys want to drag that down and open up or enlarge it, uh, by the way, if you don't necessarily feel comfortable uh, sharing with the entire group, what your question is, by the way, there are no stupid questions except the ones you don't ask. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, if you don't feel like you're comfortable asking in the public chat box, there is a private chat option. You can certainly private chat to me or Earl and we'll uh, get these things up and running for you. But let's go ahead and take some live questions at this point. Um, Earl, why don't you go ahead and kind of gather and monitor as some of these questions are coming in, and let me let me see if I can open up the phone lines here for everybody. Sure, you bet. Excited to tell me okay, about an exam. Yeah, as uh, Eric opens up the phone lines, if you guys want to put your phones on mute. We won't get the background noise that way, but just uh, real ask Eric uh, any list that you can share of what an assistant does to help delegate duties. Um, yes, Chris, uh, there there are a number of things that we can do to talk about. The other option you may want to do, uh, Chris, is to go ahead and reach out to us for one of our strategy sessions we're going to be offering. That might be a conversation that would be better handled in a one-on-one -on -one environment, um, partly because of the fact that, that it's a little bit different dynamic depending on what your company already provides to you. But basically, the list of activities or share, uh, duties that um, to help delegate, and, and we'll be doing a future webinar in this series on how to train uh, that kind of stuff. Um, the, uh, but one of the, some of the stuff we can do is, is, you know, we'll be doing some training development techniques. But one of the things is, is just, you know, look at your time tracker report, the list of things that you would like to delegate, and start using what we call a demo do debrief. Teach them by doing. The next time that activity comes up on your plate, use that activity as a training opportunity. Demonstrate for them, you know, have that assistant come in. And, and look over your shoulder, take notes as to what you're doing and why you're doing and how you're doing it. Do that a couple of times and then have them do it with your direct supervision and then the third, fourth time, fifth time around, you have them do it independently of you and you debrief it before you turn it into underwriting kind of thing. Also, Chris, you may want to consider um, your, your money-making activities, the things that you do that actually bring money into your company. Those are things you want to focus on. If it's anything else, um, a $15 or $20 act, uh, per hour activity, those are the types of things that you're going to want to delegate. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Uh, all right, next uh, next question. Um, somebody kicked in through private chat. Um, a question about being a producing manager. How do you uh, how do you adapt or evolve the 
priority issue if you're a producing manager. I'm assuming you're talking about producing manager role being, you know, you, you are an originator, you do originate loans, but you also um, are responsible for recruiting, training, and managing a loan off a team of loan officers, right? How do you manage and split payoff or productivity on those? That's a very dynamic environment, um, but ultimately, you know, it's a, it's a great way to look at. By the way, these things, these priorities shift over time too. I mean, it's like, for example, the you know, which comes first, the the processor or the production. You know, it, it, that question is going to be very different whether you're a loan officer who receives really no back-end processing support from the company who's maxing out at five loans a month. And then likelihood is you're probably not maxing out at five. You're doing peaks and valleys. You're doing eight or nine one month and one or two the next, and then eight or nine one month, and then one or two the next. The reason is is because you spend 30 days filling the pipeline and then 30 days finishing out the pipeline. And you wake up at the end of that 60 days with an empty pipeline, and you've got to go fill it back up again. And that's where that peaks and valleys comes in. So as a producing manager, you know, you've got to evaluate, you know, in the dynamic of what the value and growth to your, you know, you, you, there's plateaus of growth. So if, you know, if your team is stable and you've achieved the objectives and quota that you had for the producing manager role, then you're ready to step back and move to the, the loan production role. If your loan production is falling off, um, and and you know you know even if management isn't quite where you know your you know you know your boss is yelling at you because you don't have enough loan officers in your office, but your production's falling off. Your production is your greatest asset, and it's also more than likely your highest payoff activity. Um, you know there's a lot of the, the ebb and flow between a producer and rounder's role is one of the toughest roles in our business, I think personally. Uh, but I think there's a, an opportunity for growth in that segment. All right, uh, folks, I, I did go ahead and, and mute back the lines. Uh, the, the challenge we run into is that these open lines, uh, you know, if you've got anybody with any kind of background noise, it makes it very difficult. If you, if you would like to ask an additional question, feel free to go ahead and hit the chat button um, and, and post those questions or comments in the chat section. I'm going to go ahead and move through just a couple of key things that I want to share with you as we wrap up today's webinar, make sure we get you out of here on time. Um, just some kind of housekeeping end of the session action items that I want to make sure that you take advantage of so that you can get the full value of today's program. So if you'll, you'll hang with me here. If you do have other questions that you'd like to have addressed, uh, please feel free to go ahead and post them in the chat, either public or private. And if need be, my team and I will get back to you after the webinar. Um, or we can hang on for a few minutes after the general program closes, and then we'll uh, address those directly with you. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of your free gifts. Um, because you've taken the time and you've committed to the growth of your business and, and you've taken some time out of your value production activities, we wanted to give you a kind of a thank you gift. Um, so uh, by the end of the day or first thing tomorrow, our team will have loaded an email for you that will also have a link to the recording of today's webinar which you'll be able to have for replay for yourself. So like for example, if you wanted a little bit of additional guidance on the um, how to use the batching strategy in your specific environment or whatever, those will be available to you. And what I wanted to do is just kind of highlight some of the key things that you're going to get. The first one is Are You Driven by Latest and Loudest? This is an article uh, written by our friend David Allen um, and was provided uh, via our partnership or relationship with Loan Toolbox. So again, I want to thank uh, you know, that organization for their support of us over the years and, and encourage you to maybe check a little bit deeper. If you'd like more information about that program, by the way, feel free to reach out to me or my team about it directly. Uh, the second is what we call the Art of Setting Priorities. It's an article that can help you really dial in on how to decide what is the highest and best use of your activity or your time, what is the next most profitable activity for you to use. The third is the Daily Briefing Worksheet. The fourth is the Time Tracker Spreadsheet. Uh, that you can print off along with the instructions that will be included. The, fourth, the fifth is the hourly rate of pay exercise. This is an article directly from the toolbox that was written by Tim Brahim that walks you through how to conduct the review of that time tracker exercise and make some sense and decisions about who and how to delegate. Uh, another additional is, piece is, is you know, when you're at work, work, which is another similar article from the time management section of the loan toolbox website. Uh, the, the, the last one is this crash course time management tips. Um, it's just sort of a summary of all the topics and ideas that we've talked about today. It's sort of an action items outline that we use with our live coaching programs uh, clients as a reminder 
of how to stay on track, stay productive and proactive in your business. It's an outline of how you choose to use the pieces that you have. All right. The last thing that we want to offer to you is what we call our strategy session, which is a no cost, no obligation, one on one session. They're an hour in duration. What we'll do is we'll go deep on one particular issue that you're struggling with, or Chris, as, as you mentioned in your chat, um, you know, specific guidance on how to use some of the tools that have been shared with you on today's webinar program. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level and you really want to look deeper into how to make it happen in a lot less time, I'd encourage you to take advantage of one of these strategy sessions. Um, you know, for the benefit of committing another hour of time to it, you walk away with the action plan and, and some information about what coaching would do for you potentially. If you like it, great. If not, no big deal either. It's just an opportunity. There's no cost or obligation. If you'd like to take advantage of one of those sessions, uh, there will be a link in your session as well. Um, and when you log off the website uh, for today's webinar, the website will pop up. But if you want to go to the mxlcoach.com slash strategy, we'll be happy to have one of our coaches spend an hour with you to talk to you a little bit about how to get some movement on some of your higher priority projects. All right, so the last thing I want to wrap this session up with today is what we call the putting it in play. What do you need to do this week before next week's webinar Take the ideas that you've heard about today and get them in action. First thing I want you to decide is pick one thing. Focus. What is the most valuable thing you've heard me share with you in today's program? You can always come back to the recording later. You can always back, come back to the tools and resources later. Pick the one thing that you want to implement first. Decide what that is. Make a commitment to yourself about it. In fact, welcome to do that right now. Grab a scratch pad and jot it down while it's fresh in your mind. Second, um, what action do you need to take to make that a part of your daily business? You know, maybe it's reviewing the tools or reading the article about the topic. Maybe it's going back to this uh, recording and reviewing the section where I talked about the concept and idea and how to articulate it. Maybe it's going ahead and taking advantage of one of those free strategy sessions and, and, and having a coach give you some direct guidance on how to make it work in your business. Whatever that next action is, make the decision, what is the next action you need to take. To increase the likelihood that you'll do it, make a commitment to yourself. Promise that you'll have that action implemented by a specific target date. Okay? If you do those three things, the probability of you taking the ideas that we've shared with you today and making something happen with them goes up over fivefold. You're five times more likely to execute that one idea if you follow this simple three question pattern. What's most valuable? What action do I need to take to implement it? By when will I have it implemented? If you want to take that up significantly higher, if you want to take it up eightfold, 800 times more, 800% uh, more likely or eight times more likely, make a promise to somebody else. Ask somebody, share this action item with somebody else and ask them to hold you accountable to following through. It's easy to break promises we make to ourselves. It's much harder to make a promise we make to somebody else, especially if that somebody else is somebody we care about and trust and know they care and trust enough about us. Other than that, uh, just one quick thing. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us on today's webinar. Hopefully you got some valuable ideas and strategies out of today's program. Um, we'll be uh, you know, continuing the series over the coming weeks, months. Next week up is Coach Stephanie York, one of our most experienced and most seasoned coaches, has been with us since our launch back in the initial 2005 season. Uh, she was, uh, has, has worked with individually well over 1,500 individual coaching programs and was instrumental in the creation of the systems that we use today in our one-on-one -on -one program. And she's going to be talking to you about managing assessments and how to get the most out of yourself, your team, and your business using tactical business assessments. Uh, it's going to be a great program. Hope you all are welcome. You guys can join us for that program. Uh, again, to, to get registered for that program, do the same stuff you did for this program. Go to our website, mxlcoach.com slash webinars. Um, and, and log in and sign up for Stephanie's program next week. I'm excited to hear what Stephanie has to share with you, and, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all on a, a future webinar series. Other than that, 
wanted to thank you all for your time. Hope you take our advice and, and go ahead and use the, the action items and the putting in place strategy to get some, some action and lift in your business this week. Hopefully you'll uh, take advantage of those strategies and tools and make something happen. We'd love to hear your feedback too. If there's anything you'd like to see us improve about the program, we're more than open to those ideas. Other than that, uh, you're dismissed. We will be hanging around for just a few more seconds. If there are any questions that, that you feel a little too shy to ask directly, um, and uh, we'll, like I said, we'll be around for a few more minutes here. Uh, again, if you are interested in taking advantage of that strategy session, all you really need to do is sign off at today's program. The website will pop open uh, with uh, some just basic preliminary information that we want to try and gather from you to help you get a, a session scheduled. Okay. Well, I'm just going to kind of keep 